Well, good morning and welcome to uh, our Sunday celebration here on the 4th of July weekend. And uh, happy 4th of July to everyone. It is always great to honor God uh, who has shown his favor on our great nation over all these years. And we pray his favor will remain for years to come. Uh, Well, as we enter into the month of July, it also means that we're about 60 days away from the end of our fiscal year. And I know that may be the last thing on anyone's mind here, 4th of July weekend. Uh, uh, But uh, I want to encourage you, as uh, we come to the end of our year, uh, we always want to finish well. It's a stewardship issue for us as a church, uh, but it also allows us to plan effectively for ministry for next year. And uh, what you give and how uh, your generosity helps uh, do everything that uh, God is currently doing here. It it, uh, makes opportunities like this possible with our youth uh, going overseas. And we have so many more trips planned this summer. But uh, we'd encourage you to consider uh, being generous here at the end of our fiscal year. Maybe you'll be one that will make your very first gift uh, here at Liberty. Uh, Many of you are so generous and involved in priority and proportional giving, and we would ask you to consider helping us close the gap. We're about 4% where we want to be here at the end of the year, and uh, so small gap, but we can close it together. Well, let's pray, and then we dive into uh, God's Word in a brand new series. Father, thank you so much for your amazing grace. Uh, We are generous only because you were first generous. We love only because you first loved us. And Father, as we've sung already this morning, we are reminded that Jesus has to be the absolute center. Jesus, only Jesus. Father, we pray as we open the word of God that you would stir our hearts, that you would quicken our spirits, that we might be forever changed. And we pray, Father, that you'd begin with me. Lord, that this would be a transformational moment because of the Word of God, and we ask this in Christ's name, amen. I had several people ask why I had a suit jacket on on the 4th of July, and uh, if you ever see me in a jacket in July, it's one of three reasons. Either I'm doing a wedding, a funeral, or my mother is in town. So would you help me welcome my folks who are here on the front row? Amen. I don't know if it's sheer terror of her or just wanting to honor her uh, that I wear a jacket today, but uh, we're going to do it. She will not be here at 11 o'clock, and I will not have the jacket on (laughs) at 11 o'clock. So, uh, well, we began a new series today called Victory, and uh, really excited about this. We're going to unpack the truth of 1 John. We're going to start in chapter 1, verse 1, go all the way to the last verse in the last chapter. This is a short book, but it has a lot of profound truth for us, and it has the most accessible vocabulary of any epistle in the New Testament. Our series is going to be broken into three segments with three sermons in each segment. The first will fly under the banner, Jesus is Everything, and Steve and our praise team and choir have done such a marvelous job setting the ball on the tee for that topic this morning, that it's Jesus, only Jesus, that Jesus is the absolute center, Jesus is everything, and those three messages will focus on the supremacy and the centrality of Christ in all that we are and all that we believe. The midsection of the book will be called three marks of discipleship, and uh, those three messages will take on the three things that mark a believer as being in close fellowship with our Heavenly Father, that our love and obedience and belief indicate where we're at in our walk with Christ. And then in the final segment, we'll discover a reproducible pattern of belief and behavior that not only will benefit us, but is transferable to other disciples, those who would follow Christ. The title of our book, where did that come from? 
Well, it comes from a paragraph at the very end of the book in chapter 5 that has a strong statement and declaration of the triumph possible in the life of every believer. In 1 John 5 verse 4, listen as I read, it says, For everyone who has been born of God overcomes The world. What a sweepingly positive statement that everyone who has placed their faith in Christ has within them, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, everything necessary to win, to have victory, uh, to overcome. In fact, that's what it says in the very next phrase. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. Faith in what? Who is it that overcomes the world? This is our third redundancy here. Except the one who believes Jesus is the Son of God. Anyone who has placed their faith in Jesus Christ alone for salvation has received the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit and has the ability to win. We got the package that allows us to win. And I really believe that is what all of us are looking for. At the end of the day, what we long for most is the pathway to victory. Uh, How can we have victory in this life? And by the way, victory over what? Well, victory over broken relationships. We're going to talk about the loss of fellowship and broken relationship even this morning. Victory over that besetting sin. The book is going to say, if you say that you haven't sinned, you make God a liar and his truth is not in you. All of us are battling sin. It's victory over a life of self-determination, thinking that I can make my own way. And Scripture says there is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Victory over an unhealthy view of myself and my Savior. Well, hey, without further ado, take your Bibles and let's go to the first paragraph. We're going to cover the first four verses. This is a remarkable segment of Scripture. It is John at his very best trying to share with us the person who is everything to him, Jesus. It says in verse 1, that which was from the beginning. Very interesting phrase. We'll come back to that. Which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we've looked upon and touched with our hands concerning The word of life, notice the use of life here, because this is how Christ is being revealed. Again, it appears, verse 2, the life was manifest, and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life, there it is again, which was with the Father and was manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you, so that... You too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is one of the greatest statements in all of Scripture regarding the centrality and the supremacy of Jesus Christ. It is by far the most poetic and personal If I read this to you in the Greek text, though you might not understand the words I'm reading, you would feel the rhythm and meter and you would hear the poetry. This is a beautiful piece of Greek. Whenever we read the Apostle Paul talk about the supremacy and centrality of Christ, it sounds like we're reading a dictionary. He is very technical. He is very theological. John is writing about a friend. The one that we've seen and heard and touched and our hands have handled. The one that was with the Father was there at the beginning. The one that came to us so that we might have fellowship with him. And this is where we find complete joy. I mean, this is a very reflective, almost emotional paragraph. For John, he's writing it very late in life. He's probably in his 70s. He's probably writing from Ephesus, a place where he had done ministry for decades. He is one of the last living eyewitnesses 
of the life and ministry of Jesus. And he is writing in a compelling way because he wants people to know and hear. For him, Jesus is everything. He is the source of eternal life. He is the center of our fellowship. He is the reason for our joy. He is the model of character, the standard for every disciple. He is everything. This paragraph also reveals the important purpose of the book, and it is the purpose for which Christ came to this planet. He came, why? So that you might have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus came to include us. And John is saying, what I experienced as a young man, walking with Jesus for 36 months, sharing meals, listening to Him teach, seeing Him heal the sick, all that I experienced, you can have by faith in Christ. You, you can uh, experience what I've experienced. So in these first four verses, we see John uh, giving us three different aspects or facets of the person of Jesus Christ. If you're a note taker, start here. Jesus is the source of life. He is the source of life. You saw that uh, repeated like a drumbeat uh, throughout uh, these four verses. He's like John is keeping time with his references to life that uh, Jesus, who we've heard and seen and our hands have handled, uh, he is the word of life. He's identified as the source of life. He was the life that was manifest, and we've seen it and testify and proclaim to you, uh, the eternal life, so it's not just life, it's eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifest to us. So what does John tell us here about Jesus as the source of life? He tells us three things. First of all, he says the life that he's talking about is eternal. O in aparkis, the first words in the Greek text, that which is from the beginning. What that actually is saying is the one who was in the beginning at the beginning. The one who was before the beginning. The Apostle Paul in Colossians chapter 1 gives us a picture of this uh, Jesus as eternal life. Colossians 1 uh, verse 15, just listen as I read. He, that is Christ, is the image of the invisible God. When Jesus came in human form, took on the form of a servant, made in the likeness of man, submitted himself to death, even death on a cross, that Jesus made the invisible visible. We could not see God until Jesus came, and then we saw The image of God imprinted on the Son of God. Now notice this phrase. It says he was firstborn over all creation. What does that mean? Well, it doesn't mean that he was the first created thing. Uh, There was a group in the first century called the Arians, and that's what they believed, and they were branded as heretics. Uh, Their modern-day counterpart are the Jehovah's Witness. They believe that Jesus is a creation of the Father. Uh, That's not what it means. Uh, The vocabulary in the original here actually means this, that Christ is before all creation in time and over all creation in authority. Let me say that again. He was before all creation in time, over all creation in authority. He is the firstborn of creation. Verse 16, for by him all things were created, things in heaven, earth, visible and invisible, thrones, powers, rulers, authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Jesus, the life, the eternal life of God that was manifested to us, he existed in eternity past. He was before time. He was present at the beginning of everything else. And he will be present in eternity future. He is the eternal God. He stands alone. I stand amazed. Isn't that what we sang this morning? He is eternal. And as such, he stands alone as the one having authority to offer eternal life because 
He gave his life a ransom for many. His life, death, burial, and resurrection made eternal life possible. So here's the question. How do we access eternal life? Well, John, in writing his gospel in John 5, 24, said this. Whoever hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life. And he will not come into judgment, but it's passed from death unto life. It's as simple as that. If you hear his word, which we just read in our preaching, and you believe in the Father who sent him, you have eternal life. And you avoid hell and eternal judgment. You pass from death unto life. He breaks the cycle of death. Folks, isn't that the fundamental need of man? That death be broken? You see, from the time that Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, death became pervasive and permanent. It touched everything. It killed everything and everyone. Romans 5.12 says it this way, for as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin and so death passed upon all men for that all of sin. We need that curse broken and the only one qualified to do that is the one who was present at the beginning of everything else, who created everything else, who will be here for eternity future. He died in our place and he offers eternal life if we will just believe. What do we know about this Jesus who is life, who is eternal life? Well, we know that that life is eternal. Secondly, write this down, we know that his life is accessible What does it say in the text? Which we have heard. It's the sensory overload here. Which we have heard. Which we have seen with our eyes. Which we've looked on and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. That which was inaccessible was now accessible. That which was invisible is now visible. That which was beyond our reach is now within our grasp. Because Jesus came and he made all of that accessible. We live in a digital world, right? And people begin relationships with people they've never seen online. It sounds crazy to me. Uh, They maintain those relationships online. They even break up uh, in those relationships online. My generation and those older than me, we just can't wrap our heads around this, that you would have a relationship with someone that you have never gone face to face with. And yet, how much more difficult is it to imagine having a relationship with an invisible God? God knew this, and so he sent his son, not to make a fleeting appearance, but to come and stay. And to make accessible that which was inaccessible. That which we could not imagine, we can now experience. I can't help but think that as John, in his old age, is writing this with an emotional pen, maybe there's a slight smile at the corner of his mouth. He's thinking back to when he heard, when he saw, when he touched remembering what Jesus looked like, the sound of his laughter, the color of his eyes, what it was like to see him lay hands on someone who was sick and dying and breathe new life into them, to call Lazarus out of the tomb and actually actually see him obey. (laughs) That tender touch of comfort and guidance that John had personally felt from his Savior. I, I I wonder if he was thinking about that moment in the upper room that we just remembered and just celebrated here at communion where it says that he was leaning on the breast of Jesus as they reclined at the table in the Last Supper. We touched him. He had immense credibility, the last maybe alive to have seen Jesus. And all of it was unbelievable. And John is saying, what I accessed in the flesh, you can access through the eyes of the Spirit. You can have what I've experienced. 
What do we know about Jesus as the life and the source of life? We know it's eternal life. We know it's accessible life. Number three, we know it's transferable. Look in the text in verse 2. The life was manifest. It was, was revealed, and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. John is here at the end of his life. And his mind is spinning. How can I get the word out to one more person? I'm going to write a letter and it's going to circulate to the churches all around Greece. And I, I, it is my prayer that someone will, will hear this read or will read this scroll and, and they will realize that they can experience Jesus who is life eternal, life accessible, life that is transferable. You know, when we gather here at Liberty Bible Church, we understand that most of us have placed our faith in Christ. Not all, but some. And for those of us for whom there has been some time and distance between now and the day of our salvation, sometimes we forget. We lose the wonder and the majesty of what that moment meant. Our, uh, our salvation I mean, think about it. Spiritual death was defeated in that moment. Hell was avoided. Eternal fellowship with the Father and all those who have gone ahead of us to heaven is now possible. An unquenchable source of joy has been found. The real root cause of fear is done away. Hope is now tangible. And you can have it. You know, before we go on to finish the message, I just want to bow our heads right now. Let's just create a quiet moment. And I realize that many of us have placed our faith in Christ, but that leaves room for some who have not yet made that decision. Maybe you've been hanging around church. Maybe you've heard the gospel many times, uh, but you have not yet believed. You have not transferred your trust from yourself to Christ, and in this moment, it would be the desire of John the Apostle, if he were standing on the stage with me, to give you this moment to respond. Right now, in this quiet moment, from your heart to God's ears, maybe you would cry out with a simple prayer like this, Father, I know that I'm a sinner, and that that sin has separated me from God. But right now, I place my faith in Jesus Christ, asking him to save me from my sins and to become the Lord and leader of my life. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, if you made that decision, please tell someone. Tell the person you came with. Find me in the lobby. Find Pastor Kevin, one of us that we would love to hear so that we can pray for you and we can help you take your next steps with confidence in following Christ. Well, if our first fundamental need is to have eternal life, to have the curse of sin and death broken, well, then the second most fundamental need has to be fellowship. And what we discover in John's first four verses here is that not only is Jesus the source of eternal life, he is the center of our fellowship. After all, what was it that God told Adam early in his time in the garden? It is not good for man to be alone. It's not good. Everything else God said that God, God created, he said it was good, but he said this is not good. It's not good for man to be alone. God designed us to desire community. Think about it. Jesus could have just come and done the deed. He could have just given his life a ransom for many. Just done the transaction that provided redemption and reconciliation and then made his way back to his heavenly father. But he didn't. He came to stay. He came to build fellowship first with his mother and father and his siblings and the the villagers in Nazareth, and then beyond that, he would spend three years building strong community with 12 men, and it says that at his ascension and after his resurrection, there were 500 that were witnesses to the resurrected Lord. He came to build fellowship. Think about what our writer, John, would have learned just watching Jesus, just experiencing Jesus, what he would have learned about fellowship. 
about relationships and how that works. He would have learned that fellowship requires commitment when Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. He would have seen his interaction with Zacchaeus, a wee little man, and known that when you break fellowship, you have to rebuild it. He would have uh, been at the dinner at Simon the Pharisee's house and seen that prejudice prohibits fellowship. He would have seen him in a conversation with a rich young ruler that money can get in the way of fellowship. He would have been taught by Jesus that there is no age limit on fellowship when he said, suffer the little children to come unto me. He would have heard the greatest sermon of all time, the Sermon on the Mount, and known that humility and mercy and peacekeeping is necessary to fellowship. In his sermon in Matthew 18, that fellowship inside the home and inside of a marriage has to be protected. He would have seen Jesus show compassion for the least of these to extend fellowship to those on the fringe, to Gentiles and lepers and prostitutes and tax collectors. And he would have seen ultimate love, mercy, and grace from the cross which is the basis for our fellowship. And John himself, in particular, would have experienced the most tender moment of fellowship when Jesus from the cross looked down at John, standing next to the mother of Christ, and said, Woman, behold your son. John would have seen some of the last words of Jesus before dying on the cross, that I, I need you to extend fellowship to my mother. He would have learned so much about what fellowship meant and how important it was because Jesus modeled fellowship. He showed what it looked like. He talked about what the parameters were. He had trained them. He had corrected them when their fellowship was out of sync, and he was wholly focused on that. What else do we need to know about Jesus being the center of our fellowship. Well, not only did he model it, secondly, he included us. From the beginning, he desired to include us in his language, especially in John's gospel. It was not just for that generation of disciples, but it extended for every generation from that generation to this. There is a conversation between Jesus and Judas in John 14. You don't get many of those in the, in the Bible. But uh, Jesus is explaining to the disciples that he was going to teach them some things that he wasn't going to teach the rest of the world. And so Judas asked the question, how are you going to do that? And it solicited this answer from the Lord, which is fascinating and so tender and so fellowship related. It says, Jesus answered him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him. Here's what I want you to see. And we will make our home with him. How's that for a description of what fellowship is, this this intimate friendship? How am I going to continue to communicate even after I'm gone? Uh, the, The Father and I, we're going to make our home with you. How are they going to accomplish that? Well, three verses later it says this, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I've said to you. How am I going to continue to teach you after I'm gone? Well, the Father and I have decided to make our home with you, and we're going to send the Holy Spirit of God who will be your helper, and He will continue to teach you. Isn't this amazing? Fellowship is so important to God that all three members of the Trinity are involved in establishing and maintaining it. That's how much they want you in. Well, Jesus is the source of life. It's eternal life, it's accessible life, it's transferable life. Jesus is the center of our fellowship. He modeled it, and he included us in it. And finally, and with this we're done, Jesus is the reason for our joy. Jesus is the reason for our joy. Look in verse 4. And we are writing these things so that, here's the purpose clause, and it's actually a selfish reason. So that our joy may be complete. So that our joy may be complete. That's an interesting phrase about joy being made complete. It appears four times in the New Testament. Three of them at the pen of the Apostle John. 
in John chapter 3, he's talking about John the Baptist, and John the Baptist says his joy would be made complete when the Messiah came and he fellowshiped with him. And then Paul in Philippians 2.2, he's writing to the Philippian church, and he said, make my joy complete by being of the same mind and of one accord. When they're in perfect harmony and full fellowship, Paul's joy was going to be complete. And then in the second epistle of John, he said his joy would be made complete when he could be face to face with his readers and have fellowship with them. And then here in 1 John chapter 1, make my joy complete by entering in to our fellowship, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. What is this? The principle is this. Complete joy requires full fellowship. And when everyone that God is calling is included in that fellowship, and our fellowship is full and unhindered and complete, then our joy will be full. That is the dream, the Apostle John, for the church. He, yes, was writing to the first century Greek church, but he is writing to us. Make my joy complete, he would say to Liberty Bible Church, by having our fellowship be full. Uh, Liberty, I end every service, or almost every service, by saying I love you. But God loves us more, right? Right? So here's the assignment for each of us this week. In the middle of a beautiful July summer week, here's the assignment. Let love be unhindered, right? Do a spiritual inventory of your relationships. What needs to be resolved? Well, then resolve it. Seek forgiveness where it's necessary. Give forgiveness even when it's not asked for. Let love be unhindered so that our fellowship can be full and then our joy can be complete. Father, I pray that that assignment, Lord, would begin in my heart. And Lord, that if there is anything outstanding in the account of relationships... Father, that you would bring it to my mind and that I would seek forgiveness where necessary and offer forgiveness even before it's asked. And Lord, that I would seek to resolve that which is unresolved so that our joy would be complete. Jesus, you are everything. Everything. You're the source of life. You are the center of our fellowship. You are the the reason for our joy. Father, may we live that out in Jesus' name. Amen.